Welcome to the very first lecture of our very first unit for U.S. History A, called Early American Settlement. And as the title suggests, there's a lot to do with how and why the North American continent was settled by European, predominantly English-speaking settlers. By and large, in terms of dates, we're not too picky, just gives you somewhat of an idea of the time frame we're going to be covering. Mainly early 1600s to the mid 1700s, a little bit of the 1500s tossed in there, you know, here and there. So as we begin, our very first topic is going to address how does religion change before colonization? Because it really goes without saying that religion is a massive part of why so many of these Europeans decided to leave where they were and head across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, a couple things to keep in mind here. Remember that we're just going to present you with bullet points like you see on screen. The bullet points are a great place to start, but I'd really like you to make sure you're listening to and processing what the explanation is so that you can annotate or write your own words in the margin, either next to the bullet points or in place of these bullet points. So when we look at how religion changed before colonization, it says religious context. Context or contextualization simply means that we're getting background information. We're setting the stage for why a development happened. So in this case, we're looking at Western Europe, and you can see that early 1500s is crossed out. There's going to be a lot of dates that we see in this course that, you know, I've got them struck out. That simply means if you want to write them down, great. If not, don't worry about it. As long as you understand sequencing, you're going to be all right. I just keep a lot of dates up here because invariably a lot of these questions will sometimes come up. So Western Europe, you know, at this time, you know, by the early 1500s, with one minor disruption that occurred about 450 years earlier, the Roman Catholic Church had basically been running the show in Western Europe for the previous thousand years. Now, officially, this church is referred to as the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic. We have that bolded to stress the fact that this organization stepped in to fill the void when the Western Roman Empire fell in the late 400s. They failed administrative, meaning government. They failed economic and educational and social functions. They even maintained similar structures as Rome's empire. So, for example, Rome had an emperor, one man, one person in charge. The Roman Catholic Church had one pope, one man in charge. So just one example, but that's essentially how it was. There were kings who ruled over different territories within Western Europe, but it was widely accepted that you need the blessing of the Pope for your reign to be considered legitimate. So for about a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church has been running the show. That begins to change because of a German monk that you see on the screen, a guy by the name of Martin Luther. Not to be confused with Dr. King, who gave the famous I Have a Dream speech in the 1960s. Martin Luther was a German man who was training to be a lawyer so he could enter his father's business, kind of run the legal end of things. By multiple accounts, one day, this guy actually got struck by lightning, and he decided to devote his life to God and become a monk. You know, Honest truth, struck by lightning, decides to change the course of his life. He became a very, very religious man, very pious, truly devoting his life to God. He was a religious scholar. He was a theologian. You know, he dealt with theology or religious thought. Now, he was making a pilgrimage to Rome. Pilgrimage meaning he's making a religious journey. And he saw a man selling that one of that first bolded phrase you see on screen. He saw a man selling indulgences by the side of the road to help build a new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Now, indulgences are essentially 
quick tickets to heaven, if that makes sense. Because within the faith, you have what's called purgatory before entering heaven. Purgatory is the equivalent of a waiting room. And indulgence allows you to skip that waiting room. You go to the front of the line, ensuring that quicker path to heaven. These were first given out hundreds of years before Luther's birth during a series of events called the Crusades. The Pope wanted to raise an army to head to the Holy Land, so he offered indulgences, as in, if you fight for the church, die for the church, you're automatically going up to heaven. Fast forward a couple hundred years to Luther's time, these indulgences could actually be purchased, and the fact that they're being sold to build a new basilica, that rubbed Luther the wrong way. He took that to believe that the church was corrupt. He wanted the church to change. That's it. This deeply religious man never wanted to start a new religion. He only wanted the church to change and stop selling indulgences. So what he ends up doing is he more or less writes down his list of complaints. These grievances. And these 95 grievances became known as the 95 Theses. So a simplified version, he has 95 complaints, 95 things he would like the church to change. And these 95 Theses really caused a firestorm. This kicked off a decades-long event that we now refer to as the Protestant Reformation. So Protestant, protest, going against, and then the word Reformation, reform or change remember luther never intended to do this he wanted the church to change their ways he didn't want to start a new religion especially not one that you know bore his name luther was asked to recant meaning he was asked to pull back and kind of disavow the fact that he ever wanted to do this he more or less said sorry i can't do that i absolutely cannot go back on these beliefs but nevertheless, his ideas spread. You know, the church excommunicated Luther. They kicked him out. But he took refuge in the castle of King Frederick III in southern Germany. And he used the year that he was in this castle. I mean, it wasn't really a capture. He was taken by cloaked men who, you know, if anybody was watching, they would think it was a kidnapping. But it was all pre-planned to give Luther a little bit of time. What he did was he translated the New Testament from Greek into German, meaning a language that people could actually read. This is revolutionary. Now all of a sudden, the word of God is in a language that the common person can read, interpret, and understand. And he came to believe that everyone could be saved through salvation. You individually read and interpret the Bible. You too can be saved. So keep in mind if we're looking at building up towards a place called Jamestown, which is the first permanent English settlement, this is about 90 years before that occurs. So one of the first big changes we care about in terms of leading English settlers across the Atlantic Ocean is the fact that the Catholic Church will split up, at least in this frame, into a different sect, a different part. But that's not it. That's absolutely not all. There are new religious ideas that are going to come about because now the floodgates are open. The floodgates are absolutely open for people to profess new ideas. Now, one of those new ideas is the concept of predestination, which is courtesy of a French lawyer turned theologian named John Calvin. Now, I got, got Calvin and Hobbes down here if you're familiar with this comic. The individual who illustrated Calvin and Hobbes specifically named the six-year-old brat Calvin after this theologian, John Calvin. Now, Calvin believed that God was what we call an absolute monarch, you know, kind of like a singular king. And since God saw everything that had and ever would occur, he had already decided the fate of each human that ever had been and ever would be born. It was already decided. Thus, Calvin believed that the select few who were selected to go to heaven, all right, this select few could never lose their salvation because they were specially chosen and everybody else was out of luck. 
you know, most humans, as you can see on screen, they're beyond saving. You have no say in whether you're headed, you know, going to heaven or not when you die. Now, Calvin came up with the idea, but he influences a group known as the Puritans. You might think that if it was already decided if you were going to heaven or not, live however you want. Not so. According to the Puritans, you know, they were very punitive. They called for the death penalty for a wide variety of things. You know, you had to live a good, moral, and pious life to ensure that you would be one of the select. By living a good, righteous life here on earth, that is kind of like adding extra security that you're going to be one of these select few. So Luther kind of breaks down the door in terms of having new Christian ideas that separate from the Catholic Church. Calvin takes it a step further by coming up with this concept of predestination. The King of England takes it a step further. Now at the top of the screen on the left, you got King Henry VIII. On the right, you have his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Aragon is a kingdom in what's now Spain. And Henry wanted to divorce her. You can see no divorce for Henry VIII. The V-I-I-I -I -I means eight. It's Roman numerals for the number eight. Catherine did not produce a male heir. So Henry wanted to divorce her, marry somebody else. The Pope said no. Refused to grant this divorce. Refused to annul his marriage, meaning make it so that it had never happened. So what Henry did was form a new church, the Church of England in the 1530s. It's also known as the Anglican Church. The king was the leader of this Anglican Church. And this Anglican Church had a hierarchy like the Roman Catholic Church. So to an outsider, it might look kind of the same. You know, the king is the leader, and with this new church, Parliament, or Congress for England, definitely supported him. Now you see, as time goes on, this church begins in the 1530s. When we say Puritan, we're simply talking about a broad group of individuals within the church who just thought that the Reformation was incomplete in terms of England, this process of totally breaking from the Catholic faith. Since the Anglican Church was kind of comprised on religious ideas that sort of accommodated all British people, there were some individuals known as separatists. These separatists thought that since the Anglican Church was actually an offshoot of the Catholic Church, it was beyond saving. You know, these Puritans held private services, and they wanted to elect their own bishops. You know, with the P Roman Catholic Church, the Pope picks the bishops. With the Anglican Church, the King picks the bishops. These separatists didn't want a hierarchy to tell them who should be in charge. Now, Queen Elizabeth I actually declared separatism to be a crime in the 1590s. And her successor, James I, even declared these people to be evil. Most of these individuals conformed, meaning they kind of backed off and said, all right, fine, whatever. But others began to look elsewhere where they could practice a new purified faith. That's where this phrase Puritan comes from. Like a lot of, you know, names or terminology, Puritan was an insult. Oh, you're a Puritan. Ugh. It was meant to be derogatory, but these individuals wore it like a badge of honor. Their thinking was, you know what? If we can't practice our purified faith here in Great Britain, we are going to have to look elsewhere. And these Puritans are mainly going to affect settlement in what becomes known as New England. 